We are continuing our study of the I am's of Jesus and dealing with I am the truth. And Jesus declared of himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So we have looked at the way, the truth, and in the coming weeks, we're going to begin the study of life, the life, actually the resurrection and the life. As I have said, I intentionally skipped that part of the I am's and, and I'm really going to address it both in this study of I am the way, the truth, and the life, because that's ultimately where we're going here is the life. In John 8, we were in this last week, it says, then said Jesus, verse 31, John 8, 31, then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, we be Abraham's seed, and we're never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, you shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. If the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Now, it's interesting what Jesus said, the servant abideth not forever, but the son abideth forever. And, and just for a, a moment, God has sent forth the spirit of, in, of his son into our hearts, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So we're in relationship with God as sons. Through Christ Jesus, we are sons unto God. That's our relationship, not servants but sons, the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abides forever. And if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. And of course, the Jews said that they're not bound by any man. And we looked at this last week that they were actually bound by the man, Adam. They were bound to sin. And in fact, we're all bound by that same man, according to natural birth. So so in natural birth, we are bound to sin in a man. In Romans 5, just to refresh us, um, Paul writes, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. That's verse 12. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So all mankind sinned. For unto the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. So regardless of whether you were a Gentile or a Jew, whether you were under the covenant of the law or not, whether you were participating, the better way to say it is participating in the covenant of the law or not, you were still under sin. You were still in the dominion of the first man. That's where mankind from natural birth is at. They're in Adam's uh, disobedience. And in verse 19, Paul writes, for as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. I believe we could say all. So by the obedience of one shall many me be, me be made righteous. So we have one man bringing sin and the other man constituting righteousness. And we're going to be dealing with this in this uh, teaching today. So the word makes you free, continuing in the word. You shall be made free because you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. And knowing the truth is a person. What I want to say to you as we get 
into this is that in much of Christianity, Christians aren't free. They're not free from the law of sin and death, even though in Christ they are. In their heart and their mind, they believe somehow they're still under the law of sin and death. And we try to be made righteous in ourselves. And that is a uh, heart-wrenching place to be. Because with our hearts, many times we just desire to love God, to live for God, to do the things of God. But although our hearts want to do it, our ability is not there because of sin, because of the nature. The remedy of this is Jesus. See, the remedy of this is knowing the truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And Jesus declares that he is the truth. And this word know, one of the words for know is a uh, Greek word. One of the words is a Greek word that deals with intimacy. And that's what we have with Christ is we have intimacy. So as I'm intimate with him, I come to know him. And as I come to know him, I'm made free. Glory to God. So through our relationship, we become free from the bondage of sin, from the guilt of sin, from the shame of sin. And this word, like I said, if, if you do a word study, there are several words used for know and knowing in your Bible. But this word, the truth shall make you free, is the same word used by Mary, when Mary said unto the angel, how shall this be, seeing I know not a man? Speaking of intimacy, same word. Now, this word carries multiple definitions, but this is a, a feeling, a, 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 a very inward relationship word. So if I continue in his word, I shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And see, I believe this. Folks, I'm, I'm speaking to you out of something I'm really believing, because the Lord is making this real in my heart. He's making real in my heart that I'm really free from sin, that sin is not held against me. I'm not saying I never mess up, but I'm telling you it's not held against me. And as I come to know the nature of the Lord, and that's what we're doing in this great salvation is we're knowing the nature of the Lord. I believe there's a place where you walk in God where not only is sin not held against us, but we don't even walk in the nature of it because we're walking in his nature. I believe that. I'm not just telling you this because the Bible says that. I mean, that's part of it, but I believe it. God is making it real in my heart. And what I want to share with you is what the spirit of the Lord is making real in me, not just teachings and and doctrines, but what God speaks in my heart, and how he speaks in my heart is the revelation of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. That's really the speaking of God that's going on in us. Glory to God. I had a brother ask me one time, what was God saying to me about current events? This, is, this has been fairly fruitful fairly recent that this happened within the last couple of years. And I shared with the brother, he's really not speaking with me so much about the current events. I'm not telling you he never does, because he does. 
but I shared with you what the Lord is saying or what I shared with him is what the Lord is saying in me over and over again is a revealing of Christ, is this continual revealing of Christ in my heart. And this is what we have to come to continue in, regardless of events. I can look at events all day and, and probably become depressed with some of them. Or I can feed on the Lord Jesus and have a solution for people caught in the events. Even have the solution for the people that may be orchestrating bad th what we bad things in the earth, what we call bad things and things that are bad things as we feed on Jesus. And that's what I want to do or, or what I want to bring hearts to do is to feed on him, to know him, to know the truth and the truth make you free, make your conscience free from the guilt and shame of sin. And that's what Isaiah prophesied of, that God would lay a stone in Zion and those that believe would not be ashamed. And see, we shouldn't be ashamed because he took our shame. This should be so real to us that the Son of God took our guilt and shame upon himself. As the sinless, spotless Lamb of God, he that knew no sin became sin, that we who were in sin could be made the righteousness of God in him. And that's the secret. It's in him. We're not made the righteousness of God in ourselves. We're made the righteousness of God in him. As the Son then makes us free, we are free indeed. And Paul tells us how he did this in the book of Romans. Well, he tells us in his epistles, but Romans 6, and I read this last week, he says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Verse 1, Romans 6. God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? See, here's the, here's the, the reality. He that is dead dead to sin, no longer lives in it. Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? In other words, do you understand? Are you aware of the work of God in Christ that, that you were baptized into his death? Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Paul writes in another place, we're baptized by one spirit into one body. And in this one body, we, we come into his death. So we're buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And this is the secret, as Christ was raised from the dead. There's how we walk in newness of life, as, as he was raised. We, we walk in newness of life in the knowing of him. That's the secret of this. And, and verse 6 says, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. So we know this. This is a very intimate knowing. As the Lord works this in our hearts, we come to know this. The old man is crucified with him. That because of this, henceforth, we should not serve, serve sin. Because the old man is crucified with him, we shouldn't serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we should also live with him. So we've been made dead with him to the old man to live in union with Christ. See, in that. In the old man, or the man of sin, we were in union with him. So what the deeds and acts of Adam that he did, his disobedience brought sin upon all men. So I was unified to Adam's sin, not even because I sinned, but because I was born there. I was born in sin, conceived in sin, shaped in iniquity. I, I quoted this verse, I believe, earlier already today. So, so I was born in sin. Now, Jesus brought me to death and to a new birth. And in the new birth, I'm born in Christ, that what's in Christ may be shaped 
in me. That's, that's what we're in. So we're not under sin. We're under Christ. We're not under law. We're under Christ. Hallelujah. So many Christians think they're under law. And the word under in the King James Bible, I believe, has, has a lot of impact because it's, it deals with authority. And we're not in the authority of the law. We're in the authority of Christ. And in the authority of Christ, he died freeing me from sin that I might live unto God in him. And see, that's the secret of it. He didn't die and free me from sin that I might live unto myself. And Paul addresses this in Romans 6. But he died to free me from sin that I might live in Christ, that Christ would be my life that my living would be him living in me, that I would live out of the understanding, the union, and the reality of what Christ has done, because what he's done is made real in me by the Holy Spirit of God revealing the word, the living word that was written on my heart, it, that is the Lord Jesus. That's, that's how we're made free from sin. We continue in the word, and this word of life that's in Christ makes us free. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Now, now flipping on over into Romans 7. Romans 7. In Romans 7, 1, the Bible says, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. So as long as a man's alive, the law has dominion over him. All right, what did we read in Romans 6? We're dead. <laughs> We've been baptized into his death. So this no longer has dominion. Verse 2, for the woman which has a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he lives. But if the husband be dead, she's loose from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband lives, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. By the offering of the body of Christ, we become dead to the law. We are joined to him. Just read that. Baptized into his death. Planted together with him in the likeness of his death. In order, and here's why, that, verse back in verse 4, that we should be married to another, to him who is raised from the dead. So our union is not with this one. That's under the law. Our union is with him that is raised from the dead and that we should bring forth fruit unto God. And how we bring forth fruit is in a union, is in a relationship. For when we were, were in the flesh, we brought forth <laughs> the fruit of the flesh. That's what Paul is saying in verse 5. That when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit into death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. So in the newness of the spirit, we see the Lord Jesus. That's what Jesus said the spirit's going to do. He's going to come and he's going to take that of me and he's going to show it unto us. So we see by the spirit that of Jesus, and we see that we're no longer under the law. The American Standard Version says that, but if the husband die, in verse two, she is discharged from the law. So she's not under it. <laughs> in the in dealing with the natural relationship of a husband and wife, if the husband's dead, a natural woman's not bound to the law of her husband. If she marries another man, she's not an, adult, an adulteress. Now, I used to preach this toward the natural, to try to convince people not to be married and divorced. And I believe if you're a Christian, 
you shouldn't be married and divorced. I'm just being honest with you. But not, not just because the law said it. I believe it because as we come to an understanding of our union and relationship with the Lord, that we're one with him, then in our marriages, in our homes, in our relationships, we should be manifesting and ministering that we're one with the Lord. So we should be one with our husbands and our wives because of the relationship we have with God, not just because the law, because we're not under the law. You're not under the law. You are free through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ from the law. And I'm not going to put you back under the law, but you're free from the law to be married to Christ, not for your own self, not for your own self. And this is where people think that, you know, they get free from the law, they can live their own life. That's not true. We live by the life of the Son of God who gave himself for us. Our union is with him. We're in relationship with him to bring forth his fruit in this earth, this earth, this vessel, to bring forth out of this vessel the relationship of God that we have. That's what we're called to do. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Paul says of the law in verses 7 through 14 that the law is holy and good. But he says we're carnal or he's carnal and sold under, under sin through Adam's disobedience. So, so he said there's nothing wrong with the law. The problem with the law wasn't the law. The problem with the law was you and I. Hallelujah. So we can have all the laws in the world and can't come to the righteousness of God because the righteousness of God is a person, a new man created of God in Christ Jesus. Jesus came to give us the righteousness of God. He gives it to us. He gives it to us. Hallelujah. However, we understand this, we begin to carry it upon our hearts, in our minds, as we know him. That's why it's important to get in our word every day, to eat his flesh and drink his blood, that we would know him, and that through the knowing of him, we would be transformed. We would be renewed. We would live unto God. Now, to me, that is salvation. That's great salvation. That I don't live under the penalty of sin, but I live under the authority of Jesus Christ. And through his authority, I'm blameless and righteous through him. And like I said, it is a gift. In Ephesians 2, verse 1, the Bible said, And you did he make alive when you were dead through your trespasses and sins, wherein you once walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the powers of the air, of the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom we also once lived in the lusts of our flesh, doing the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we're dead through, dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And how he did that is he put our trespasses up on Jesus. It says, by grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and made us sit with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should glory. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God afore prepared that we should walk in them. So, we're made alive in union with Christ. By grace, we're saved. 
It's the gift of God. And John 3, 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, John 3, 14. Even so must the son be lifted up that whosoever believeth may in him have eternal life. This is getting to life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have eternal life. The life of Christ is what this is dealing with. Eternal life. For God sent not his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world should be saved through him. We're saved by grace. And great it is the gift of God. God so loved that he gave his son. That whosoever believes on him. This is how I receive the gift of grace. I believe on Jesus Christ that he took my sin, he took my shame, he took me, my nature, my mind, everything of me, and he brought it to the cross and he crucified it, that I could be united with him to this death, so all this of me, all this stuff that could never fulfill the law could be put away, and that in him I could come to the righteousness of God, in him, See, this is a great mystery. It's in him because I'm united together with him in his death. And I come forth with him in his life. So it's in his life. And that's where the mystery of this thing is at. And this is where we have to be very careful. And Paul says in Galatians 5, he says, be not in you. Well, American Standard Version says, For freedom did Christ set us free. Stand fast, therefore, and be not entangled again in a yoke of bondage. So be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage. And what Paul was dealing with in the book of Galatians was a people wanting to go back under the law. And, and like I said, in Romans, Paul says the law is holy, just, and good. But the problem with the law was you and I. That was the problem with the law is although the law is holy, just, and good, you and I were enslaved to sin. But we've been married not to the law, but we've been married to Christ. Through the offering of his body, he's delivered us out of the law to bring fruit unto God. So we can't go back to performance-based religion or the law. And so many of God's dear people, that's where they want to go. They want to find their righteousness in the law. And Paul says to them here, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will profit you nothing. Yea, testify again to every man that received a circumcision that he is de a debtor to do the whole law. You're severed for Christ. You who would be justified by the law, you're a falling, fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit by faith wait, expect the hope of righteousness. We were looking for it in Christ. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth nor uncircumcision, but faith working through love. So, so we're not going back to the law. The new covenant is not Jesus plus the law. It is just Jesus. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. So the servant abides not in the house, but the son abideth in the house forever. And if the son make you free, then you're free indeed. And if we come to know the truth or the son, you could say either one, you will get free and you will realize that your life is hid with Christ in God. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. You'll realize that. You'll come to a realization that he's really my life. That he's really made me righteous. That I'm really clean and acceptable unto God. Not because of what I've done. Because I've received the gift of righteousness who is Jesus Christ himself. And I'm eating him. You know, I'm not going back and eating the law to try to get good enough for God. 
I'm eating him that makes me good. I'm, I'm receiving his word. See, Jesus said that they may be one as we are one. I and them, thou and me, that they may be made perfect in one. And that's through believing him. That's through receiving him. Hallelujah. That's how we, we, we come there and attain that. It's not through us keeping the Old Testament law. It's through receiving him that fulfilled the law. He fulfilled it. Love is the fulfillment of the law. God so loved the world. He gave his son. <laughs> what kind of love is this that, that a man should die for the ungodly? That's what he did. He, he came without impartiality. So the love of God is not partial to me, like, like our love is partial. But the love of God's not partial. And it's only in the love of God that we begin to know impartiality. As, as he's revealed in us, we become impartial. We want this word to go forth to every man because the impartiality of God is working in our hearts. I'm telling you, honey, he doesn't look at, at one man and, and say, well, this one man is, is not worthy and this man over here is worthy. He's, he's impartial. And, and he, his love was toward all. <laughs> Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Whosoever will, let him come and drink of the water of life freely. That's whosoever. And, and this works in us to, to declare it to all, to anyone. And we rejoice with them that receive it. We rejoice with those that hear it, those that understand it. So we don't become impartial and only rejoice with some, we rejoice with any. I, I make this statement, some of my greatest friends, my greatest friends are members of the body of Christ. And I guess if you put us in a room and you started looking at us in the natural, a lot of times we have almost nothing in common. Many of my great friends that I have have no natural commonality, but what's common with us is the Lord. And our union with one another has been building the Lord and the, and the love that I have for these brothers and sisters is God's love, I guess, is the only way I could say it, because I love them. Because God has united me with them in this glorious appearing of the Lord Jesus. Because there's brothers and sisters around the world, in the earth, that have seen the cross or, and are seeing the cross and the beauty of it, being free from sin, living unto God. And they know that's not through going back and trying to perfect ourselves through the law, but it's receiving Jesus Christ and the perfection that's given through him. That's the difference. See, the law, we try to perfect ourselves. And, it, and even us that were never part of Judah or Israel, we still go back there through the rules and regulations. And we read the Bible many times like, like it's a set of rules and regulations. And we go back there and we try to get perfect because we say, well, the Bible says, and it does, it says a lot of things. But we try to be perfect by rules and regulation instead of knowing him. You shall know the truth. At that day, you shall know, Jesus says, that I am in the Father, ye and me, and I am in you. So if I know I'm in him, if I come to a knowing of him, hallelujah, he's righteous. So I come to a knowing of righteousness, of wholeness of purity. I can go on and on. And that's what we have before us. We have the riches of God in Christ Jesus. We have godliness before us. 
See, see, many Christians think, well, I can never be godly. And I want to tell you, yes, you can. Because godliness is in you. Godliness is the person of Christ. He's godly. So before us, just like Paul said, is the hope of righteousness. So is the hope of godliness. And it's not something that I'm hoping way out in the future I'll get. It's as the godly one is made known, as his godliness is made known in my soul. As his love is shed abroad in my heart, I can love you in his love. That's the glorious reality that we're in, is this Christ is being made known in his people. And he's setting us free from sin and death, from, from all of the torments. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. So, so be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage, but Jesus says, get yoked up with me. Take my yoke upon you and do what? Learn of me. Not, not become religious, but learn him. And when I learn him, I get free from death. I get free from hell. I get free from all these things in the knowing of him. My God, this, this is such a great place to know the Lord. I, I would love to just give it to the whole earth, just to know the Lord, just to know him. Because it's a great place. It's, it's full of life. It's full of peace. It's full of rest. There are so many people in turmoil in their minds, in their hearts. But this is eternal life, Jesus says, that you might know the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you sent. And see, he's made us free from the turmoil, from the noise to know him. Well, I pray this just richly bless your heart and touch you deep, that this word of life would minister into the depths of your heart to know the Lord Jesus. May God richly bless you. Amen.